Father, what a comfort um, to have your love in these days and in this life. What a comfort to no longer be under your wrath. What a comfort to no longer be a slave to sin. What a comfort to no longer only have a status of unrighteousness. You give so, so many good things to us. And we are in your favor as those who believe in Jesus. And we are under your love for us. You are a father to us. You hold our hand. You hold us up. You carry us through every storm. Our Father, we rejoice to know you, to be known by you, to be loved by you, and somehow now, God, by your grace, to be able to love you in return. Father, sustain us even more today and open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things in your word before us here. Let us see your good works in salvation. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 26 is where we have been it's where we will be today, Lord willing. It's probably where we'll be next week as well. And as you're turning to Romans 3, verse 21, I am going to talk about something for a few minutes of which I know very little. Everything I know about it I got from a Google search, so this is a heresy alert, just letting you know. <laughs> the very livelihood of an auto mechanic depends on stuff like carburetors. You know, the crucial part of the engine that mixes just the right amount of air and gas so that combustion can occur in your internal combustion engine. In fact, to be exact, 10 milligrams of gasoline are required per combustion stroke. Go figure. And... An auto mechanic's livelihood also depends on important things like catalytic converters, integrated catalytic converters. It's even fun to say. Carburetors, combustion strokes, integrated catalytic converters. Now, a mechanic who didn't know these terms or understand these terms would not be a mechanic to entrust your vehicle's care to. Mechanics have their own unique terminology, vocabulary, don't they? And we non-mechanics, we get that. We understand that. We have a category for them having their own unique vocabulary. We don't have to understand those terms because we're not mechanics and our livelihood does not depend on them like a mechanics does. But boy, do we want our mechanics to be passionate about integrated catalytic converters and carburetors and combustion strokes and whatever all that means. And how weird would it be if a, me if a mechanic was kind of unconcerned about those things or maybe even embarrassed by that terminology, ashamed of that terminology? Well, listen, as Christians, not as th theologians, First and foremost, not as seminary professors, not as prof uh, pastors and elders primarily, but as Christians. We have our own terminology. We have our own set of vocabulary. And it has been determined by the Bible that is open in front of you. And Christian, your life depends on what these words mean. Our passage in Romans 3 contains some of the most important terms and vocabulary that you'll ever know. Look down at verse 24, a, a phrase like being justified. Justification. Do you know what it means? Verse 24, redemption. Do you know what it means? Go to the next verse. Propitiation. Do you know what it means? 
if a mechanic must know his terminology because his livelihood depends on it, how much more so must you, Christian, know these words? Because your soul's good depends on what they mean. These are not terms just for theologians and seminary professors and pastors and elders that are Paul's writing to first century Rome, a church in first century Rome. They probably didn't have an education as big as yours. And he's writing to them. He's writing to us, to Christians. And if it's strange that a mechanic would be embarrassed or maybe ashamed of his own unique terminology, how much more bizarre is it for Christians to be unconcerned about these terms or maybe even ashamed by having to say them in front of people or... Listen, we are alive in Christ. We have a relationship with the God of the universe because of justification, because of redemption, because of propitiation. We do. Now, is it helpful when a mechanic can explain to me what is wrong with my car using terms I can understand? Look, I'm not a mechanic, and and that's what a mechanic has to do with one who doesn't know the intricacies of the internal combustion engine. And of course, it's helpful when you, as a Christian living in a lost world surrounded by unrighteous sinners, it's helpful when you can explain in terms they understand what biblical salvation is and what biblical salvation is not. Of course, that's helpful. But here, gathered together, as believers in Jesus Christ. We're gathered here together as believers in Jesus Christ and God's word is open on our laps and God has revealed himself to us in terms and vocabulary and he has revealed his salvation for sinners like us in terms and in vocabulary that we must know and of which we must never be ashamed. In fact, we make no apology for teaching the church what these words mean. We make no apology for using these terms in the church. When talking about our great God and our salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. In fact, do you, do you hunger? Do you hunger to know what these words mean? Because your soul depends on what they mean. And you might say, I'm not sure I could really say what justification is exactly. Or or I'm not really sure what propitiation even means. But what matters is there's a hunger in you and a desire in you as a Christian that you would say, but I want to know what those words mean and I want to know them better than my own name. And we'll tackle one more of these important terms today, the word redemption in verse 24. But before we do, we need to remind ourselves once again briefly how our passage, chapter 3, verses 21 to 26, vitally depends on everything that has come before it. Romans 3, 21 to 26 is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the salvation of sinners, and it is vitally dependent on the bad news prior to it in Romans In Romans chapter 1, it says that we are all under sin and under wrath as those who are unrighteous sinners. In fact, we are unrighteous in every way possible. And we are that way by choice according to the gospel. And we find out in Romans chapter 1 that God is wrathful against us, justly so. And then Romans 2 makes it very clear to us that there are no exceptions among us. No one person has ever distinguished himself as being above the rest. We, according to Romans 2 and even in chapter 3, we are all personally, we are individually, we are collectively, we are equally all under the reign of sin and under God's wrath. And according to that bad news of the gospel in Romans, We have no interest in any of that changing. That's what the gospel says about you, and that's what the gospel says about me. 
But the gospel wants to go even further with you and me on this. The gospel labors in Romans 3 then to close our mouths in protest against that. To close our mouths so that we can't protest anymore that all-encompassing indictment over us. Romans chapter 3 verse 19 says, now we know that whatever the law says, and that's a reference to the scriptures above, we know that whatever scripture says, it speaks to those who are under scripture so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable. All the world may become accountable. Every mouth closed. No more protests against this all-encompassing indictment. You see, as long as you protest against the indictment of being under the reign of sin like everybody else is, you're going to try to distinguish yourself apart from the rest. And as long as you are willing to attempt that in your own unrighteousness, the good news of Romans 3, 21 to 26 will be absolutely of no help for you. And so here we are at Romans chapter 3, verse 21, at the good news. And listen, we don't define what news is the good news for us. God just tells us what it is. It's his good news. And the good news for an unrighteous sinner in this passage, one who has been brought into silent agreement with the bad news is this. The good news is God's righteous status comes through faith in Jesus Christ to the unrighteous sinner. That's the good news. All that we have ever been on our own, all that we ever can be on our own, all that we will ever do and be on our own is unrighteous. But God's good news for us is that his own righteousness, which is the only righteousness he even accepts, he freely gives it to the unrighteous ones through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the good news. So Romans 3, 21 to 26 is all about God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners in salvation. Let me read it for you. Here's Romans 3, 21. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he, so that God would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So let's continue our study this morning of this great righteousness for all those who believe in Jesus Christ. We're taking it one feature at a time. We've already covered five. We're going to review through those, and then we're going to add one more today. So the first gospel feature of God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners in salvation is this. Number one, God's righteous status is found entirely separate from our works. This is review. Verse 20, back up even before our passage. Because by works of law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through law comes the knowledge of sin. But now apart from law, apart from doing the works of law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. It has been revealed. What we need most desperately as unrighteous sinners is God's righteousness. That's what we need most. And 3.21 tells us that that will never come through our works of law. Like day and night are never found in the same place at the same time, neither will God's righteousness and your good works with law be found in you at the same time through your good works. They're mutually exclusive. And listen, that's not bad news for you. That's good news for you. What a mercy from God. You say, well, how is this so? How is it that God's status of righteousness, how is it that I can't even begin to kind of impress him a little bit with some religious activity? 
Well, it's not primarily because of the deed you did or the work that you tried to do. The problem is you. The problem is me. It's because we are the wrong kind of people. We are unrighteous. And all that I could ever touch with my unrighteous hands will only become unclean because of my unrighteousness. God's righteous status, God's righteous status is a hands-off matter for dirty hands like mine and yours. God's righteous status is found entirely apart from our works. Number two, the second gospel feature is this. The Old Testament testifies in agreement with God's righteous status in the gospel. Verse 21, this is being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The gospel makes this claim that, you know, God's righteous status will not be found anywhere in connection with your good works. That's the claim the gospel makes, and the Old Testament testifies in agreement with that. When the rebels Adam and Eve crawled into the deep weeds after they sinned against God in the garden, and they began plotting their evil intentions against the God that they now hated, God never promised his righteousness to them if they did some good deeds. He never did. Those are the earliest pages of the Old Testament, of the law and the prophets. In fact, let's just break the Old Testament down into those two pieces, the law and the prophets. The law and all of its sacrificial system and instruction never taught Israel to perform the religious law so that God would declare them righteous with his righteous status, with his own righteousness. And the prophets who over and over and over cried out against God's rebellious people, Israel, they never urged Israel to do good works so that God's righteous status over them could be declared. They never did. And you say, so then why did so many of the Jews, in fact, almost the entire nation, become so works righteousness concerned? Because they're sinners like me and like you. They were not that way because the Old Testament told them to be that way. And they weren't that way because they were Jewish. This is not a Jewish problem. This is an arrogant, prideful, human, sinful, unrighteous problem. And had God come to me and my family and promised a nation and given me law eventually, we would have done the same thing. And so would have you. Your Old Testament and your New Testament are in complete agreement on where God's righteous status has never been found. It has never been revealed. It never comes on the basis of doing good works with law. Your Old Testament and your New Testament are not in conflict with one another. The Old Testament testifies in agreement with the gospel on this claim that God's righteousness has been revealed entirely separate from good works. The third feature, still in review here, is this. Faith in Jesus is the instrument through which God's righteous status comes. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. The righteous status of God that will have nothing to do with your good works or with mine. It is revealed, it is manifested through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is deeply humbling for unrighteous sinners like me and you. Because all that, as we said, all that I can ever produce, all that you will ever produce on your own is unrighteousness. And the gospel says that about us. That's the gospel's testimony to us. The gospel also then tells us this, that in that unrighteous condition... Even if we try to add some religious law to our lives to do it, two horrible things occur. One, we will never distinguish ourselves from the rest. I will still be just like all the rest, and so will you. And even more importantly, number two, God's righteous status will never come through that. That which you need most, God's righteousness, will never be discernible in your life if you go that route. But the gospel simply says, in your unrighteousness, believe Jesus Christ. 
and God's righteous status that you desperately need is manifested through faith in him. Faith in Jesus is the instrument through which God's righteous status comes. The fourth gospel feature, number four, is this, still reviewing, faith in Jesus is the one hope. Faith in Jesus is the one hope for all unrighteous sinners. Uh, Verse 22, the last part in all of 23 are kind of like a parenthesis for the idea of through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, parenthesis, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Meaning, no one has distinguished himself in such a way that faith in Jesus is not necessary for him. Why is that true? Why is that true? For there is no distinction. Well, why is there no distinction? Verse 23, because all have sinned and are falling short of the glory of God. You see, no matter who you are, No matter how good you think you've been, and no matter how bad you know you've truly been before God, you cannot put yourself in a classification, you cannot put yourself in a distinction where faith in Jesus is not your answer, your solution. The gospel in Romans 1, 2, and 3 made it very clear that there is a one-size-fits-all problem. We are all under the reign of sin, and we are all under wrath. And now the gospel, in its good news, is making it very clear that there is a one-size-fits-all solution to the one-size-fits-all problem And the one-size-fits-all solution is faith in Jesus Christ. You will not meet one person in heaven one day who got there by another means. Faith in Jesus is the one hope for all unrighteous sinners. The fifth gospel feature of God's righteous status, still reviewing, is God's righteous status or justification is God's gift by grace. Verse 24 being justified. That ties back up to verse 22. For all who believe, those who, all of those who believed through faith in Jesus Christ, they are being justified as a gift by his grace. And that's what Paul has been talking about. It's justification. You know, a righteous status that does come through faith. A righteous status that is not tied to good works. That's being justified. Being declared righteous with God's righteous status on the basis and through faith alone. Listen, being justified is not this. It is not God validating your own attempt at righteousness with good rules. That is not justification. It is not God validating your attempt with a set of rules. Rather, it is God declaring you to have His status of righteousness, even though you have only ever been unrighteous. Being justified is not exactly the same thing as forgiveness of sin, as wonderful as forgiveness of sin is. And being justified is not only the absence of sin and therefore the absence of God's condemnation. It includes that, but it's more than that. You've heard it said, you know, what what does it mean to be justified? It's just as if I have never sinned. That's the absence of sin and therefore the absence of something negative, God's condemnation. And that's wonderful too. But being justified is more than that. Being justified is primarily something positive. It is the possession of something positive. It is the possession of God's righteous status over your life. And when he sees what is his... When he sees his own righteous status over your unrighteous life, what happens? Well, God sees what he has been for all of eternity. He sees what he has been for all of eternity when he looks at you. What happens? He sees what he is moment by moment by moment by moment. He sees what he does in every situation. He sees what he loves. 
He sees what he accepts wholeheartedly without even a reservation anywhere in his mind because it's his own righteousness he sees. He sees what he blesses. And he treats you on the basis, therefore, of what he is and what he does and what he loves and what he accepts and what he blesses. And so what favor positively do you possess because of a declared righteousness over your life through faith? And all of this in verse 24 is without a cause. It's a, as a gift. That's what as a gift means. And this is by grace, by undeserved favor. So God's righteous status or justification is God's gift by grace. And that leads us now to our sixth gospel feature of God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners and salvation. This is the new point. Here we go. Jill, just take this one today. Christ's Ransom payment is the means through which God's righteous status comes. Verse 24. Being justified as a gift by his grace, here it is, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Now, the main verbal idea in verse 24 is being justified right there up at the top at the beginning of the verse. And that means, again, being declared righteous with God's righteous status. That being justified is a reality that is without a cause within you. That's what as a gift means. It is by grace. And the next, Paul says, being justified is through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And, and the word through indicates that redemption is a means or an instrument or a, a vessel through which being justified comes to the one who believes, like faith is a means, it's an instrument, so is Christ's redemption prior to it. God wants his righteous status declared over the believer to be delivered through the redemption that is in Christ. God wants his justification of sinners to be closely associated with his redemption of sinners in salvation. What does redemption mean? To redeem means to set free. It means to liberate by the paying of a price. It's, it's to secure the release of a slave or a prisoner by paying a ransom price. And that only makes sense against the backdrop of slavery. And it's clear from Romans 1 two, and three, that the human race is enslaved to, enslaved under unrighteousness and sin. You can look back at chapter three, verse nine. Paul says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged, meaning everything I've been writing before this, we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin, meaning they are all under the reign of sin. Sin is a master, and all of humanity is under the reign of sin. So when God saves unrighteous sinners like us, part of what he does in salvation is redeem them, to pay the ransom price required to set them free from that reign of sin. And the ransom price... Ephesians 1.7 helps us know this. In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. Through the shedding of Christ's blood, we have the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So being declared righteous with God's righteous status cannot come to us through any other means but through Christ's shed blood at the cross, which is the ransom payment required to set me free from the reign of sin, to set you free from the reign of sin in your life. And God wants and has his justification associated with, better, delivered through redemption. 
He puts these two things very close together. You can see it in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, how closely he puts justification and the shedding of Jesus' blood together. He says in Romans 5, 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. These two things you cannot pull apart, our redemption and our justification. What an escort for our justification that redemption is. What a pathway through which our justification travels to come to us, through redemption. What a delivery vehicle through which our justification arrived. The ransom payment of Christ, of his blood for us. Our justification comes through our redemption. So when God saves unrighteous, under the reign of sin, sinners... He, without any cause in me or you, declares over us a status of righteousness that's his, his righteousness. We must have that status because we could never be it, we could never do it, but it's the status that he has always been and is and ever will be. And he will only treat us according to that righteous status. But even more, his son's blood is the currency and price required to break the yoke of slavery over you and free you. And God does both of these things in your salvation, believer. He must justify you and he must redeem you from the reign of sin. And that justification comes through his redemption. Now, I want you to understand this. This is some of the best news ever. (laughs) Listen, God will not declare you righteous through faith by grace and leave you a slave under the reign of sin. He won't as if he would just be satisfied to just keep seeing his status of righteousness all the while you suffer under the reign of sin in your life, a tyrant ruling you, someone else ruling you other than him. He will not declare you righteous and leave you a slave under the reign of sin. Is that good news? And it's true the other way too. He will not free you from the reign of sin over your life, but then leave you without a status of his righteousness. How could he be content to see you free from sin, but still be without his righteousness? No, God takes care of both in salvation. He declares you righteous or he justifies you with his righteousness as a gift by grace through faith, and through his son's shed blood, he redeems you from the reign of sin. Your justification comes through your redemption. What a great God. What a great God. He hasn't forgotten anything. He's thought of things that you and I have never even thought of in salvation that we need. And you'll see there's even more next week. And this is really important to understand again. We'll just say it again. Nothing of either justification or redemption is contingent upon you. Nothing about justification or redemption is given to you to perform. Justification is a gift. It's without a cause in you by grace. And even the faith you exercise is a gift from him, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And the blood price required is not paid by you. So you see, salvation is all on God, but it is all for you. He's done it all, 
and we receive it all or we have nothing. I'll tell you the good works that save sinners, the the good works that save sinners that are impressive are God's good works in salvation. And notice carefully back in Romans 3.24, notice carefully how Paul says it. Through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't want to make too big a deal about this. But notice he didn't say the redemption that was accomplished by Christ. What the gospel is doing here, it's not merely pointing to an event historically. It is. Not taking anything away from that at all. The gospel doesn't merely point to an accomplishment, the crucifixion of Jesus. It does. That historical event truly is crucial for our salvation. But notice how the gospel speaks of our redemption, that primarily it is tied to a person. It is located in a person, Jesus. Jesus was at the event He he accomplished the event at the cross, obviously. But Jesus exists beyond that event, and that's the point. He exists beyond that accomplishment. Wherever Jesus is, there our redemption still is. Our redemption is, is linked to that crucial historical reality, no doubt, And our redemption is an ever-present reality secured for us in the person Jesus Christ and located in the person Jesus Christ. As long as he is, so is our redemption from the reign of sin. That's good news. So where is your redemption, believer? Where? Yes, look to the cross. Yes, look to the cross. Even more so... Where is your redemption? It is in the man who died on the cross. Where is your redemption? It is in the man who was put into the tomb. Where is your redemption? It is in the man who came out of the tomb. Where is your redemption? It is in the man who ascended to the right hand of the Father. Where is your redemption? It is in the man who right now intercedes for you. Where is your redemption? It is in the man who will come and raise us from the dead. Where is your redemption? It is in the man who will come back and put every nation under his boot. And when you see him, you'll say, there's my redemption. Because it's in him. Christ-focused redemption. Christ-centered redemption. Your redemption is secure in him, and get this, as long as he is, your freedom from sin is. <laughs> that is amazing. Now, if that's what God does to save us, and we haven't even talked about satisfying his wrath, which is in verse 25. If this is what it takes to save unrighteous sinners like me and you, who are under the reign of sin, and if this is how God saves us, then what an absolutely ridiculous, worthless, foolish, empty sham it is in any attempt on our part to try to save ourselves by good works. In fact, it's looking at God and saying, well, wait a minute, you're you're gonna declare me righteous just by your own grace through faith? You, by the price of your own son's blood, that's what redeems? No thanks, but watch what I can do with some law in my life. You know what that is? That's not just stupid, (laughs) but that is an affront to God. That shakes a fist in the face of God and says, no, I will trust God. In me. Foolish. Foolish. Wicked. That's wicked. Why would you trust in yourself? Why would you trust in your own unrighteous abilities 
to add some law around your life and get to work with it in order to earn God's favor. What that is an indication of is that you don't yet really know how unrighteous you are. I know that's blunt. You got to get there. You got to get there. Do you have any idea how unrighteous God says you are? You can't add law to your life. Do you have any idea how righteous he is? Whatever standard you think it is that God accepts, you haven't thought high enough yet. You just haven't. Do you have any idea how strong the bond of sin is on you? How tight the grip is on you? You don't have what it takes to break it. You don't have the currency it takes because God only deals in the currency of his son's blood. You need to know how high a price the ransom payment is. You can't do it. You can't be it, what you need to be in salvation. You can't earn it. Only God is it. Only God. And that doesn't mean God sits back and isn't willing to save sinners. Because he gives his righteousness freely as a gift without any cause in you or in me. He's not stingy. He gives it to all who will believe Jesus' death at the cross and the shedding of his blood is the only sinner's hope to be freed from sin and faith in him is the only way to be declared righteous with God's very righteousness that he loves. Listen, there's, there's not multiple versions of righteousness that are credible in God's eyes. There's only one, and it's his. And you have it through faith in Jesus Christ, or you have nothing. Not even freedom from sin. Have you believed Christ? Will you believe Christ? Let's pray together. Oh, Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you for your selfless love for sinners like us, that you would live into your fourth decade and that you would be willing to, knowing all along where the, your life was headed, that it was headed to the cross, it was headed to the shedding of your blood as a ransom payment for enslaved sinners who stood at the foot of the cross and mocked you, that you would do this and cry out to your Father, even on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And Father, we can attest to that. Those of us who are believers in Jesus now, that as we look back, we had no idea what we were thinking without you. And running after our own sin, and we had no idea what we were thinking when we justified ourselves trying to do good works on our own. We were clueless, God. What kind of love is that that does not wait for people to grab a clue? What kind of love is this that does not wait for people to clean themselves up first? What kind of love is this that just says to the unrighteous and to the filthy, you're clean because of me? It is a love incomprehensible. It is a love that goes beyond anything that we could ever know. Father, open the eyes of even sinners this morning here that they might see this great love that you have for sinners through your son Jesus in his redeeming work at the cross. Oh, Father, we thank you that you, in declaring us righteous, did not leave us slaves of sin 
And that's your promise to the one who will believe today, who is being oppressed by their own sin and unrighteousness. And they have maybe thought of and tried ways to get out from underneath the reign of it, but they have never been able to break the bond. Lord, that's your promise to them. Declaring them righteous through redeeming them. Father, we give thanks that in freeing us from sin, you didn't leave us to try to establish even still our own righteousness, but you gave to us your righteousness through faith in Jesus. Father, we just sit back and marvel and worship at who you are and the kind of God you are that you would do this for unrighteous, under the reign of sin, sinners like us. You are glorious, God. You are great. You are to be praised. Father, take these truths, take these gospel features of your righteousness and impress them deep down into our lives. Transform us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ that our lives might be different, that we would live as free men under your lordship. Father, how great you are, how grateful we are for you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.